welcome back to my channel. So today's tutorial is all about chocolate ganache. So many of you have requested this video for a long time, so I hope this really helps you and answers a lot of your questions. So chocolate ganache is a combination of cream and chocolate, and there are so many different ways of making it and different uses for it too. So for example, I usually use it for the drips going down my cakes, but I also use it to fill chocolate cakes or even cover cakes if I want a specific design on the outside. You can also use it to fill macarons or top different desserts too. So depending on what you're using the ganache for depends on the type of ganache that you want to make. Now, if I were to just say to you it's X amount of grams chocolate and X amount of grams cream, I can assure you that you won't be using the same chocolate and cream that I'm using. Did you know that cream comes in different percentages? So for example, in England, I know that you can get single cream, whipping cream, double cream, double double cream. In America, there's heavy cream. And where I am in Israel, I get 38% cream or 32% cream or 42% cream. So wherever you are in the world, there are different types of cream that you can buy. So even though the creams have different names, what they do have in common is the same sort of percentage of fat. So it is helpful here having the percentage written on the packet. But for example, here I use 38%, which is the equivalent of whipping cream. And I've also got some dark chocolate. Now, just like the cream, chocolate also comes in different percentages. You've probably seen when you go and buy some chocolate, even in the supermarket, that the dark chocolate you can get 70%, 80%, even 90%. So that's to do with the cocoa amount in the chocolate, but it also affects the fat amount. So the less cocoa in the chocolate, the higher the fat. I have to remember that every time I say it out loud. So the chocolate I use is the caliber 54.5% cocoa. So it's still got a taste of dark chocolate, but it's not as bitter. So I love using this, and therefore I know that this chocolate and this cream works together in specific ways. So if you're using a darker chocolate, for example, a 75% chocolate, you may need to increase the quantity of your cream because the chocolate doesn't have enough fat in. And on the flip side, if you want to use milk chocolate or even white chocolate, you'll need significantly less cream because the chocolate has more fat. So this is what I mean when I say there isn't one specific recipe for chocolate ganache. It's all about what cream and chocolate you are using. On top of that, it's also about what you're using the ganache for, whether it's dripping down the side of a cake, you want it at a specific um, consistency, but if you want to fill a cake, it needs to be a little bit thicker. If you're preparing a cake for fondant, for example, you need it super thick. So again, that's why the recipe can alter. So what I'm gonna show you first is how to make a basic ganache using the cream and chocolate. Now a good starting point is to do one part cream to one part chocolate, so equal amounts. So for example, I have 150 grams of my 38% cream, which I'm going to start heating up on the stove on a low flame to get it nice and steaming. And then in this bowl, I've also got 150 grams, so the same amount of my 54% chocolate. So this ganache creates perfect drips and a perfect spreadable consistency for cakes. That being said, it depends what cake you want to do. And it also depends on your climate. Yes, we have to consider our environment. So I get a lot of you asking what you do in more humid countries or hotter countries. So chocolate ganache is actually a great uh, savior when it comes to cakes because it doesn't melt as quickly as buttercream does. So what I'm going to do today as well is show you how to coat a buttercream cake in ganache so it stays uh, firmer for longer. So even though I'm heating the cream up on the stove, you can simply put the cream and chocolate into a microwave safe bowl and heat it up in the microwave. Two things you need to look out for. Firstly, put it on 20 to 30 second spurts. Don't ever put chocolate in the microwave for longer than 30 seconds at a time in case you burn the chocolate. Secondly, give it a mix in between those spurts because you don't want that cream getting too hot, otherwise it will completely bubble over. Which reminds me, every now and then, I take the pan and just give it a swirl to make sure that the temperature of the cream remains even and then put it back on the fire. And what you're looking for is a nice steaming temperature. That is 75 degrees Celsius 
um, but I never actually measure that. I just go by the steam. So some people leave the cream long enough for it to completely come to a boil. However, I don't like doing that because you end up forming a skin on the cream, which I believe leads to splitting ganache. Um, I might be wrong, but all you're doing is heating the cream up enough for it to start melting the chocolate. Okay, so I'm not sure if you can see it on camera, but there is lots of steam coming out of the pan, but it's not come to a boil. So it's definitely up to temperature. And now all I'm going to do is pour it on top of the chocolate, which of course is in a heat proof bowl. And then I'm going to leave it for about 30 seconds to let the heat start melting the chocolate before I start mixing it. So it's been about 30 seconds, so all I'm going to do now is start stirring it together using a spatula. And as I'm stirring, you can see that the cream has melted the chocolate and is coming together. And once all the cream is mixed in, it becomes this beautifully silky soft texture. And of course, if you've been watching my other tutorials, you'll see that this ganache is the exact same ganache that I use for dripping on cakes. So when I touch the bowl, I can still feel some heat. So if I leave it to cool for about three to four minutes before dripping onto the cake, it's the perfect consistency to create some beautiful chocolate drips. So just a few things about this stage that could potentially go wrong. Firstly, if you heat the cream and chocolate in the microwave and you are at risk of burning the chocolate, you will get lumps of chocolate. So you may confuse that with that the cream hasn't melted those parts of chocolate, but it is in fact burnt chocolate. So that's something to look out for. Secondly, you can split your ganache. So this either happens early on, for example, at this stage, or later after you've left it to set. Now, I've discovered that it does come down to the quality of chocolate that you're using. If you use a compound chocolate, which is a cheaper uh, chocolate that you can buy from the supermarket, for example, it has a lot more oil in, and the oil and cream aren't friends, and the oil starts to separate. So, for example, if you leave it to sit and then mix it back up, the oils have separated and then it splits. You can bring it back together, sometimes, either by heating it back up and kind of redoing this stage, or with a hand blender to make sure it's really whisked into each other or adding a little bit more cream. And that extra bit of cream usually helps bind the ganache together. So there are three tips if you find that your ganache is splitting. However, I have done this completely by hand and you can see what a beautifully smooth silky ganache it forms. Some people do now blend this with a stick blender I personally don't. To be honest, I don't think you need to. However, it does kind of bring it to that next stage of silkiness, so that's totally optional. Now, what to do when the ganache is made? So either you can use it straight away for dripping or you can leave it at room temperature for it to set, like I've done here. So what I've got here are two bowls of ganache that I made earlier. So this bowl here has the exact same quantities that I have just done. So equal amounts of cream and chocolate. I think it's 250 cream and 250 chocolate. I left it with some cling film over the top overnight at room temperature. Now, remember I said that it is slightly warm at the moment. So it is still on a slightly looser side, but I always prefer having ganache on the slightly looser side rather than the slightly thicker side because it's easier to apply to a cake. So that is what the ganache looks like after being left at room temperature. Once again, in a cooler climate, it may be a little bit firmer. Now in this bowl, I have done the exact same technique, however, have added a lot more chocolate. So this is actually double chocolate to cream. So once again, I'm not sure if you can see the difference, but it is a lot darker because of course there is more chocolate in this bowl than the other bowl and it is thicker. I made this ganache about four hours ago and have been leaving it at room temperature and because there's a lot more chocolate in it, it is firming up a lot faster. The reason why I'm showing you these two different quantities is to show you the difference in how they work. Now essentially, it's both ganache and they both work in the same way. However, because there's more chocolate in this one, it tends to firm up more and becomes a little bit stiffer to use once it's on the cake, but you can use it to your advantage. For example, I'm going to make some extra decoration for the cake, which I'll show you in a minute. And because it's firmer, it's better for warmer climates. So once again, 
if you are in a warmer climate, I would recommend using the thicker ganache. So that's double the amount of chocolate to cream. So before I show you how to apply the ganache to a cake, I'm just going to give you two extra tips when it comes to making the ganache. Firstly, I would always recommend leaving it overnight to set. I think it becomes the perfect spreadable and piping consistency after having been left overnight. However, if you are in more of a hurry, there are a couple of things which you can do to cool the ganache down even quicker. Firstly, is using a bowl of iced water. And all you do is place the bowl of ganache inside and start to turn the ganache like this, and then out again, and then mix it again. So what you're doing is introducing some cooler temperature to the bowl, but what you don't want to do is leave it in there for too long, otherwise it will start solidifying the ganache. So if you do think that your ganache is on the looser side, then grab yourself a bowl of ice water and dip it in two to three times, you may need more, and stir it. And what you're looking for is the consistency of Nutella. It's the closest description that I can think of to compare the texture. You don't want it too thick, otherwise you'll find it hard to pipe or apply to a cake. Now the other option is using a tray to cool it down. So I'll show you with the looser ganache that I made just now. And rather than cooling it in the bowl, if you pour it out onto a tray and spread it out thinly, then because it's got more surface area, it will cool down quicker. So this is the same with most hot fillings, whether you're doing creme patisserie or a fresh batch of chocolate ganache. This is a really good technique to cool it down quickly. What I wouldn't recommend is cooling it in the fridge because the fridge is cold and it will cool the bowl and the surface of the ganache and not on the inside. So that's why I prefer either the iced water method or this method or of course leaving it overnight. Now, I think I've done enough talking on ganache, so I hope I've covered the majority, but now I'm going to show you how to apply it to a cake. So what I've got here is a six inch crumb coated cake in buttercream. So the great thing about ganache is that you can cover any sort of cake with any filling. Just a quick tip from what I know from fellow fondant cake makers is that underneath fondant, you want a layer of ganache. So this comes in handy if you're making a fondant cake, but you don't want to do a chocolate filling. Do the cake as you wish with vanilla buttercream or something else, and then do a layer of chocolate ganache before you do the fondant. The reason why you want a layer of ganache under there is to get a nice sharp finish before the fondant goes on. But I'm just gonna show you how to do the covering and how to apply it. So once again, I have my one-to-one -one ganache here. And even though it's still on the slightly looser side, because the cake has been in the fridge and it's cold, the coldness of the cake will help set the ganache. So hopefully it's going to work really nicely. So as usual, with my step palette knife, I'm going to go on the cake, starting with the outside. Applying a small bit at a time. So usually when I do the second layer with buttercream, I go on with quite a considerable amount, but this is kind of the opposite with ganache. You want to build it up in layers. Because each layer of ganache will start setting to the cold cake, you want to take advantage of that. But if you put on too much, then it won't set. By keeping your ganache soft and then using the coldness of the cake, it actually becomes a lot easier to spread. So you can see that there are still parts of the cake showing through from underneath, but I'm not worried about that because this is just the first layer of this ganache. So as I'm adding the ganache, I can feel that that first layer of ganache is setting and therefore I can start building up the layers and hide the cake from underneath even more. And I'm also going to do the top of the cake like I usually would. So spread it out towards the edges and then get that top nice and flat. Now once you've done the top, the ganache is most likely to set. So try and make it as flat as possible. And of course, as you're working, the ganache is still setting in the bowl. And so that's why I like working with the ganache at the slightly looser stage because I know it's still setting and firming up. I think I'll do a couple more layers of ganache around the outside. So something else to note is that if your ganache has set a little bit too much 
and you're finding it too stiff to apply to a cake, then you can heat it up over a pan of hot water. But don't leave it on there, kind of touch it, similar to how I was doing with the iced water. Place the bowl on the pan of water for about five seconds, then bring it off and give it a mix. And that should bring it back to a more spreadable consistency. So now it's time to scrape the sides. Now it seems like ganache is actually more difficult to work with. However, it has the resistance that buttercream doesn't and therefore scraping is a lot easier to do on ganache. So I am going to scrape just like I would do with a buttercream cake, but because the ganache has set, I can apply quite a lot of force and I'm not too worried about scraping off too much. I'll go around a few times, scrape off anywhere that has excess ganache to maintain a straight side. So there's all my extra ganache, which of course is more set because it's been on the cake, and go around a couple more times. And you can really see how set the ganache is to the cake. It's hardly coming off my fingers. Because it's so resistant, I think you can get straighter edges with ganache. So I'm really happy with that covering. I can see that the sides are perfectly straight and the ganache is smooth. As usual, the ganache has been pushed upwards and I've got this kind of rough looking effect, which I'm going to leave because I'm going to put this in the fridge, not the freezer. Ganache doesn't need to be in the freezer because it sets very quickly. And then I'll trim off the top corners. I'm also going to apply slightly different technique with the other ganache that I made on the outside. So this is the base, but if you were doing a ganache filled cake, and for example, this is your crumb coat, then leave it in the fridge and then you can do your second coating with either buttercream or more ganache. So it's the same either way round, but once again, the ganache helps you achieve this beautiful shaped cake, which sits in the fridge until it's nice and firm. So I wanted to show you another technique that you can do using the thicker ganache. So this is the double amount of chocolate to cream, which is already thickened up really nicely, but because it's going to set really firm, then you can be a little bit creative in how you apply it to the cake. So once again, you can do the same as I just did, just by covering it. However, it will set a lot quicker and you may need to heat it up over water during the process. So I'm going to create panels of chocolate ganache, which is going to set hard in the fridge and then break up and make it look a little bit wood-like. I'm going to make this cake more of like a woodland mystical forest theme anyway, just because I was using the chocolate ganache and thought what I can make out of it. So this is quite an interesting technique if you wanted to try something different. So what I've got here is just some plain baking paper and I'm simply going to spoon on the ganache and spread it out with a large palette knife. And I don't want it too thin because I want it to hold itself still, maybe about half a centimeter thick. And then I'm going to place it on a tray, which will go in the fridge, but I'm going to do one more piece of paper as well. And because it's flat, I could just place it on top of the other piece and then set this in the fridge for about 20 minutes for it to completely firm up. So while I'm waiting for those panels of ganache to set in the fridge, I'm going to trim off the excess of the ganache on the cake. So it is completely set. So like I would do with buttercream, I'm gonna go around the very top edge with a sharp knife and cut away this excess ganache. I'm just going to bring those edges in to just smooth over that ganache more. So I'm not applying any more ganache at this stage. So there, super, super sharp corners. I always think that I get sharper corners with ganache than I do with buttercream. So there is the finished ganache covered cake. So I'm going to wait a little bit longer for the panels of ganache to set to show you the other technique. But just another tip, ganache is really easy to reuse. So for example, I've just cut away all those edges. I can put them back into the same bowl as the looser ganache, mix it together to get a more pipeable consistency, or reheat it for drips, etc. You can reuse it all the time, so it's good to know. Anyway, I'm going to wait a little bit longer and then show you the next technique. So the slabs of chocolate ganache have completely firmed up, which means I can take them off quite literally, well, 
<laughs> in one piece. The idea is to kind of break this chocolate up and create kind of pieces of wood. But before I break it up, I want to add some texture. Now, the paper has actually stuck. And I feel like that if I pull the top layer of chocolate off, the hole underneath will break. So what I'm actually going to do is texture it first and then break it up. And all I've got here is a chopstick. And I'm going to use this to kind of indent the chocolate and create random lines throughout and almost draw on a wood tree-like effect. So the chocolate's actually set so much that I can carve into it. If I just brush the excess away, you'll be able to see these marks going on in the chocolates. And if you wanted to get really creative, you can actually draw into ganache as well. So for example, if you use this thicker ganache onto a cake, I've seen beautiful drawings straight onto the ganache as well using this method. Ganache is just so versatile. And I actually did a ganache cake in my Back to Basics series where I textured it as I was applying it to the cake as well, which is also a really cool technique. And I think I'll go over it a bit with a fork as well. Ah, that's a lot quicker actually. <laughs> Get more lines done at the same time. And this really interesting texture has formed and it does resemble wood. So now what I'm going to do is peel off this top layer of chocolate. So at first I'm just going to try and separate the two pieces. I want like pieces of wood so it doesn't matter what height they are, what width they are. It actually looks like a tree cutting right there. Oh, that's a nice big piece. I'm gonna break it up like this. <laughs> kind of looks like I've just gone to a playground and stolen all of those wood chippings. <laughs> so these big pieces are nice as well. And now I can apply it to the cake. So I have some soft ganache here, which I'm just going to use as glue, put it on the side, and then take one of these pieces and press it against the cake. And I'm gonna go all around the bottom of the cake to kind of create this like random wood-like effect. So I'm just clearing out any spilt over ganache from when I stuck on the pieces, as well as adding texture if needed. So I'm going to put this in the fridge for the last time, just for those pieces to firm up against the cake before I finish the cake off. So before I finish off the cake, I just wanted to show you, this was the fresh ganache that I had left to cool on the tray, and it's become a silky, smooth, perfectly pipeable ganache. So I'm actually going to use this to stick some decorations to the cake. So I'm just going to fill up a piping bag like usual. And what I've actually made are some cute meringue mushrooms to go with my woodland themes. So this is the same recipe as my meringue kisses, just piped in little blobs. I'm sure I'll do a tutorial of them one day. But before I put them on the cake, what I love doing when I work with chocolate ganache is actually dusting details with a little bit of gold because it really enhances the texture and shape that you've created. So what I've got here is some edible gold dust and a rather large food safe paintbrush and very, very lightly, with hardly any gold, dust over those panels. So you can see it's just added also another dimension of colour. So now I'm going to go on with my mini mushrooms and finish off the cake. So you can also see how beautiful and silky the ganache is to pipe. And of course this will help stick the mushrooms to the cake. There, so I think there's enough mushroom magic on there. And because it's a mystical woodland cake, I'm going to finish it off with some edible glitter. And there you go, everything, or at least I hope everything you need to know and you've wished to know about chocolate ganache and how to apply it 
to your cake. So give it a go. Of course, if you do have any more questions, write in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. I know ganache can be tricky, but I'd love to see your take on either this cake or a cake of your own and using ganache to its full potential. So as usual, please tag me at George's Cakes on Instagram if you do try anything out because I love seeing your creations. And in the meantime, we'll see you very soon for more tutorials.